Lord, we're thankful for your blessings to us. We, we know the rain is a blessing, though sometimes we complain. But Lord, you're good to us. You're faithful to us. And today, as we take a few moments to look at your word, we just want to ask you, Lord, speak to our hearts. Uh, you have a message for each of us. Maybe a message that no one else will hear. But Lord, you have something you'd like to say, something you'd like to jump into our lives with, and we just invite you to let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, speak to our heads, speak to our lives, and Lord, be who you need to be for us. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. So quite a few years ago, and you'll understand I say quite a few years ago, uh, Sheree and I decided to take a vacation. We were living in South Florida at the time. I was pastoring in Plantation. And, um, you know, we, we had our kids in school, and, you know, it's uh, like you don't have a lot of money when you have kids in school. So we decided we were going to take a vacation that was cheaper, not so far away. We were going to go to the Upper Keys. We love the water, and so we thought, let's just take a, a local vacation. The Keys aren't that far away from where we were in Fort Lauderdale. And so we thought, we'd just go down there for a few days and enjoy it. Now, we were able to do that because our sons were old enough to go to summer camp. That kind of tells you how long ago that might have been because they're both married adults now. And so uh, they went to summer camp at Camp Kalakwa, and we decided to go south. And because of the shortage of funds, it's expensive to go down to Key Largo and the Upper Keys and those places. And and do all the things you want to do. So we thought, let's save a little money. We'll spend a couple of days camping. And why not go to the Everglades? Because we love the Everglades. Now, if you've been listening carefully, you're already seeing some problem. Because my kids are in summer camp. You know what time of year it is. And we're thinking of going to the Everglades in the summer. Catch that? How many have been to the Everglades? Oh, a lot of people have been to the Everglades. Well, you live in Florida, so you already have some idea, but the Everglades is just more of the same. Lots of water everywhere, and summer warm weather. So I'm giving you hints, but I'll get there. So what we decided to do was just go and camp out for a couple of days in the Everglades, saving money for the Upper Keys. So if you want to go into the Everglades, you go down near Homestead, you go down the road. There's a long two-lane road that takes, I don't know, over an hour, maybe a lot longer because we stopped along the way. And so by the time we were getting to the place we were going, which is the southernmost part of the Everglades National Park, a place called Flamingo, appropriately, it's one of the few places in Florida that you actually can see wild flamingo, and even then it's not very often. But um, Flamingo is a campsite and a little kind of... Uh, place where people, a couple buildings and stuff, and people kind of end there and do all kinds of stuff. And so we were going to go to Flamingo where there's a campground. And so by the time we get to Flamingo, it's almost dark. It's really kind of dusk. We'd been enjoying the day and stopping along the way, so it's pretty late. So we realized that it's being late, and it is Florida. We weren't naive about the situation. We put on a lot of bug spray because it's summer in the Everglades, and we knew there would be bugs, so we thought what we'll do is we'll just jump out of the car, we'll get our tent, and we'll very quickly set it up and just jump in because we know there's going to be some bugs. Well, we started to do that. We, we got the tent out and pulled it out of the bag and began to put the poles together, and you know how you run the poles through the slots, and we're starting to put our tent up when we suddenly realized that we had made a big mistake. The mosquitoes in the Everglades are just at a different level than I've experienced anywhere else. <laughs> and since most of the other humans were too smart to go camping in the Everglades in the summer, we were like the only, you know, the only meal in town. <laughs> and so word went out on Mosquito Shortwave that there were humans actually out in public <laughs> in the south part of the Everglades, which is their convention center, and, and they just started coming from everywhere, and we were the only target. They just came in just more than a swarm. It was hordes of mosquitoes, and they just thought that all that repellent we put on was the appetizer, <laughs> and they were going for the real thing. And so we looked at ourselves, and we realized that there were mosquitoes like blanketing major parts of our skin. It's like, wow, this is, this is crazy. This is unbelievably stupid. And without a word, we looked each other in the eyes and 
suddenly just stopped what we were doing, grabbed this loose tent that was all scattered, just grabbed it, grabbed the poles, threw it in the trunk of the car, jumped in the car and just drove out of the Everglades. Found a cheap hotel in Homestead. Whew. I'll never forget that. And if you haven't been to the Everglades in the summer, you really should try it. <laughs> Even for one minute. <laughs> But that evening, I learned a life lesson, a lesson I'll never forget. And that evening, I learned that it is never too late to make a decision to change directions and do the right thing. It is never too late to make a decision to change directions and do the right thing. So here's the question I would like you to think about today. What road are you following right now that you may need to rethink with your destination in mind, where you really hope to be going? Where are you going with the choices that you are making right now? So let's talk about the story of these two roads. Les gave you a hint. He gave it away. No, not quite. Just give you a hint. Two roads. There are two roads. Both of the, the stories are told to us by Luke. Luke writes in his gospel one of the stories. We'll come back to that second. And the other story he writes in the book of Acts. So these are both stories that he wants us to understand because they share something about how Jesus works and what he's doing. These are New Testament believers that have two very different experiences and two very different roads in order to follow and find Jesus. The first one we'll go to in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And I'll give you a little prelude before we jump into that verse in verse 1. Um, here's the story. Saul, who we know as Paul, he is not the Old Testament King Saul. I've told the other service, I'm going to let Pastor Jeff tell the Old Testament Saul stories because he's better at pronouncing all the other names that go in those stories. So I'll let him do that. He does that very well. So I'm going to tell you the story of the New Testament Saul New Testament Saul was a believer. Now, he didn't know Jesus. He didn't believe in Jesus. But he was a serious believer. He had gone to school. He had been educated by some of the best rabbis. Uh, he, he had studied the Old Testament, what was available to him, the books of Moses, the prophets. He had become very knowledgeable about these things. And then what happens is he's living in Jerusalem and he's being a faithful follower of God faithful to the best of his knowledge, very serious about it. Pharisee of Pharisees, he later, later tells us. And Jesus comes into the picture and chaos begins to take place because the Christian faith begins to disrupt what, what Saul, Paul, had come to count on was the faith. And now there's this new thing that claims to be the Messiah that's promised. Saul knows all these words. And yet he doesn't get it. He's uh, following the line that the Pharisees are following. This has got to stop. This is causing disruption. This is dangerous to our faith. And so being the committed believer in God that he is, he decides he's going to help end this problem in the faith. He is going to persecute and try to destroy the followers of Jesus. Now, they weren't called Christians yet. They were not called Christians for several years after this, but they were people who followed Jesus. They were known as the way, the followers, the way, the path. So the, he decides he's going to do something about it. So let's jump into this and capture some of the story of what happens to Saul as he goes out to do what he thinks is a faithful thing to do as a follower of God. So meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he could introduce himself, see the letters, so that he, if he found any there who belonged to the way, the path, the followers, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Now, think about this for a moment. He's going along the road, 
Suddenly, a bright flash of light. Now, this is not like a Hollywood light, a little bing, not like that. This is a bright flash of light that knocks him to the ground. Literally, knocks him to the ground. He's on the ground, and what we find out as we continue to read is that he is immediately blinded. That's a, that's a sudden light at a big moment, right? That's traumatic. He's blinded by this, and so he's like, what just happened here? Who are you, Lord, he says, verse 8. And he gets this answer. I'm sure he didn't expect this. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. So this is Saul who becomes Paul. And so often we think of that transition as happening very quickly. But it actually doesn't. When you read the rest of the story, you realize that from this moment, this life-changing moment, Paul now gets sent into the city where he needs to be on timeout. God basically puts him on timeout. He's blind. He can't do anything. And he's sent there and he's asked to wait until some people will come pray over him. And it's actually quite a while that he's on timeout before he's sent loose to become the great missionary that we know of him today. The one who writes so many of the letters in the New Testament. You know, the Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and the list is long. Corinthians, a couple of books. And he writes all this as a person who has great understanding of the faith and the scripture. But he wasn't that person until he was caught on the road in a traumatic moment because Jesus wanted to turn him around. Jesus knew who he would be. But he has to wait. He has to be humbled in order to receive and follow Jesus. And someday he becomes the one we know as the greatest missionary probably of all time. There's another story. A story of um, some other believers who also were going through a different kind of experience. This is an experience that had happened prior to what happened with Paul. This is an experience that happened at the very time of the crucifixion, the weekend that Jesus went to the cross, died, and was raised. So these are believers that had been following Jesus. These are the people who had put their trust in who he was, who thought that what Jesus brought was the hope for the world, that they saw their world changing because of Jesus, but they didn't understand what he had said. They didn't expect Jesus to die. They thought Jesus was going to bring a new kingdom on the earth where they were, and there would be freedom and hope and, and peace. And then Jesus, they watched him. They, he goes to the cross, and he dies on the cross. And they, they have no way to understand what's just happened. They're, they're confused. And we hear in these verses that They're wrestling with this. They're talking about it. They're trying to figure out what what happened here. They've got some clues, some rumors are going around, but they certainly have no idea what has just happened. And so we'll start the story here in Luke 24, starting in verse 13. It starts with on the same day. Now, what's the same day? The same day is the resurrection day. It's It's the first day of the week when we know that Jesus came from the grave, but they don't know that yet. So on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That's quite a ways, good walk. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. They were kept from recognizing him. They they didn't know who this was. They, They couldn't see him. I know that it was Jesus. They just, some guy comes up, starts walking with us. And they're talking about this confusing things that happened over that weekend because they don't understand it and they're just trying to process it together. They're hurting a lot because Jesus is gone. And so he asked them, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they were stunned that he would ask because one of them's Cleopas says to him, are you the only one who is visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here on those days, these days? So here's a person on the road with them coming from Jerusalem 
towards Emmaus, and he's asking them, what's happening? How could you have been in Jerusalem this weekend and not seen the crowds? How could you have been in Jerusalem and not heard the people crying out for Jesus to be crucified? How could you have been there when they dragged him through the streets and it brought all kinds of attention and people watched as they hung him upon the cross? How could you not know what happened in Jerusalem this weekend? Where were you that you didn't catch what just happened this weekend? So they're like shocked. They stopped walking because they're so shocked. It's like, what? How did you miss this? And he says, what things? So he wants them to tell the story, obviously. So they do. Verse 19. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Had hoped, notice. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions, other disciples, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. Now, can you imagine this going through their mind? The rumor at the time, when there was so much uncertainty, was the body was gone, but who took it? So it doesn't just disappear. They didn't know Jesus was really alive. It was hard to believe that. So they believed that maybe some centurion or somebody had stolen it away or one of the political leaders had tried to steal the body to, to depress the excitement among the believers, to somehow get them to stop hoping in Jesus because his body is just gone. There's nobody left for you to talk about, nobody for you to memorialize. So we'll just steal his body. And that's what a lot of them were thinking. They didn't know that he was really alive, though they'd heard these rumors. And so here's something strange Jesus says to them. These are hopeful believers. And here's what Jesus says. Verse 25. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So they didn't know the stuff that probably Saul knew. Saul knew the scriptures. He knew there were promises about the Messiah. He didn't believe them, but he knew them. These disciples had put their trust in Jesus, so they'd seen all that he had done, but they didn't know how he connected to the Old Testament, how he was foretold in the prophets. And so Jesus gives this, probably the first Bible study, on how all the promises about Bethlehem and the, and the lineage of David and how all these things were fulfill, fulfillments in the life of Jesus. This Bible study about how he was predicted all along, even from the book of Genesis, that your seed, the seed will bruise the heel and break the head, right? So all these promises... And Jesus explains it all. Of course, they have some time. It's seven miles, so it's a while. And there's a lot to tell. It's a lot to tell about those promises. And Jesus shares all of it from the books of Moses to all of the prophets, telling the promises of God fulfilled in the life of Jesus. How can you give up on him when all these promises have been told? And so they approach the village here in verse um, 28. They approached the village to which they were going, and Jesus continued as if he were going to go farther. In other words, they're here, they stopped to go into the village, and he's just like, okay, it's been nice, we'll we'll keep going here. And they're like, no, no, wait, wait. Uh, They're so excited about what he's been saying, they don't want to leave. They want to hear more. So they say, please, it's late, we've got to stop. Stay with us. We'll have supper together. Let's just continue this conversation. It's really exciting. And so they stopped, and Jesus went in and stayed with them. And when he was at the table with them, verse 30, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Now, wait a minute. This is familiar. These guys have seen Jesus pray over bread. They've seen Jesus break bread. 
this is familiar to them, something all of a sudden comes to mind. And it says in verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Now, wait a minute. Just as they see who he is, he's, they've been with Jesus all day, all afternoon, seven miles. How many of you walk seven miles every day? It's a little bit of a trek. So he's been with them for seven miles. They had no idea it was Jesus. Suddenly he breaks bread and they're like, eyes are open. It's Jesus. He's alive. Confirmation. He really is alive. And then, boom, he's gone. Disappears. Now, this part of the passage doesn't tell the rest of the story. And we won't go into all the verses, but here's what happens. We're told that within an hour of that happening, they are so excited about seeing Jesus. He is alive. They've seen him with their own eyes now. They are so excited about all that he has shared with them, they cannot contain themselves. So they've been on a seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And within the hour, the scripture says, they went back on the road, back to Jerusalem. They get back to Jerusalem. This is a 14-mile round trip. Are you up for it? That's, a, that's quite a ways. Back to Jerusalem, they get in with the disciples and they're giving their testimony. They're sharing what Jesus has said to them all along the road. They're telling everyone, we've actually seen Jesus. This is exciting. There's hope for us yet. This is the greatest joy. And as they are talking with the disciples, guess who shows up? Jesus shows up in the midst of them. They saw Jesus twice in one day. The day of the resurrection. They see Jesus twice in one day. Can you imagine their hearts? Now, even more excited than just seeing him, they know who he is from promises of the scripture. They know who he really is and what's really going on and why he died and is raised again. So these disciples had just faced the greatest disappointment of their lives. They had followed Jesus and then they had seen him crucified. All of their hopes in the promised Messiah, the Christ, had been smashed by the events in Jerusalem that weekend. So what do you do now? Where would they turn now? Jesus met them along the road of their disappointment and their sadness and he turned their hearts towards burning hope and joy. It says that here. They, they say, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They were so excited. Thankfully, Jesus is still meeting people on the road today. Sometimes he needs to stop us abruptly in our tracks. Sometimes he needs to figuratively blind us so that he can open our eyes to see. Sometimes the disruption is so difficult and painful that we don't welcome it, but it's exactly what we need to be able to find Jesus. You ever experienced one of those? But there's other times where it's not a Damascus road. Sometimes it's an Emmaus road. Sometimes he just comes alongside of us to say, aren't you kind of missing the point here? Isn't there something you need to be aware of or pay attention to? Maybe he comes alongside us in prayer and begins to speak to our lives. Or maybe while we're reading his scripture and he has some word for us that we really need to hear that will change the course of our lives. Maybe it's through a friend or a pastor or someone along the way who just is used by Jesus to come into your path, come into your life and say, there's something more you need to understand. There's something more you need to do and you need to make a decision about this. Because he cares about us. And he doesn't leave us alone. Today, here's what I want you to ask yourself. What road am I on right now? If Jesus showed up suddenly in the middle of your week, what would he need to say to you? What would that conversation be like? Would it be a really difficult one like Saul, Paul had to hear, you're persecuting me? Why are you working against me? Why aren't you understanding what you're really doing here? Even though you want to be faithful, you're trying to be a good believer, but you really, what you're doing is not helpful. You're actually hurting me. 
Or maybe it's more subtle. Maybe it's just there's something that needs to change that would give you a clearer walk with me, and I need to tell you about it. I need to help you see it. Because if you see it, your life will be better. Your, your walk with me will be more joyful, more eventful in some ways. So it may depend upon the road that you're walking right now. There are many roads. There's the road of doubt, the road of anger, the road of apathy, the road of jealousy, the road of bitterness, the road of loneliness, the road of greed, the road of selfishness. I don't know what your road is. It may be a road that's unique to you, something that is making it difficult to really follow Jesus where he would lead you. I can't know the road that you're experiencing now, nor can I ro- know the road that you might be tempted to follow in the future. But I do know this. Jesus is walking the road. Jesus is in the road, waiting somewhere in the middle of your road, your life, ready to encounter with you, ready to help you, to explain something to you, to turn your life in a different direction. And one way or the other, he will get your intention, however he can or must. Because he wants to ask you, what are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Who are you really following? So folks, today I've learned, and I hope you have too, that it is never too late to make a decision to change your direction. By doing so, to choose to trust and follow Jesus with all of your heart.